She was the first female Prime Minister of Denmark, and now Hella Thorning Schmidt is campaigning for children's rights around the world. I'm Tanya Breyer, and welcome to a special CNBC conversation from Davos 2019. Hello, thank you so much for joining me here, the CNBC conversation. As CEO of Save the Children, how important of a platform is Davos? I think it's very important for international NGOs to be in Davos. Uh, and I think it shows the, the journey of uh, the World Economic Forum over the last 50 years, that we've actually seen that it started out with only economic players being uh, here. But now it's just been, he, I mean, it, Professor Swab has just gathered more and more people. We see the art here, we see indigenous people, we see religious leaders, we see NGOs. Uh, and of course, it's important for us to be here. It's important for Save the Children to be here, to talk about our message and uh, how uh, the globalization can benefit the most marginalized and deprived people uh, on, pla on the planet, which are often uh, children. And right now, as we speak, it is children who live in a war or a conflict zone. Look, Hello, it feels like we're living in a chaotic world. You yourself have been on the ground in Jordan recently at the Zatari refugee camp. You've been with the Rohingya refugees. You've been in Yemen. You've seen firsthand how these conflict zones are affecting children, as you say, and, and the people there. What would you want governments to do more to help? I think that's part of our message here because one of the discussions that we have a lot in the World Economic Forum, and I was part of that, I was co-chairing three years ago when the Sustainable Development Goals were just new and fresh and everyone wanted to discuss them. Now it's like we have forgotten a little bit. So I'm also here to try and remind uh, global leaders that we still have a chance to live up to the Sustainable Development Goals, but that a few things are setting us back considerably. And one of the things that are setting us back is that we have so many people and children living in a conflict and war zone. It hasn't been more uh, in the last two decades. Uh, one in six children are living in a war conflict zone. And of course, it's impacting some of the very important sustainable development goals. It's impacting the goal to have a, a, a world where no child is hungry. It's impacting the goal about education. Uh, it's impacting the goal about a better health for children. So that is why we are seeing that the reason why we are held back in reaching the sustainable development goals is because uh, the, the warfare against children that we are seeing across the world. Hella, you're a mother yourself. When you're on the ground meeting the children, meeting the refugees, what is that experience like for you? Um, I, always, I always try to be professional about it because the last thing that people need when I sit uh, and talk to women and their children is for, for me to be too emotional. But I have to tell you that last year I was in, in Yemen um, and I saw things there that were so bad that I don't understand how people survive a day there. I saw camps which wasn't even camps. There was just like people didn't even have a tarpaulin. We were at Save the Children giving vaccinations under a tree where we brought like our little medical clinic out there, giving the, where the mothers came under a tree. It shouldn't happen in 2018. I sat with a baby. She was seven months old. She had the, the weight of a newborn. And if we hadn't reached her that week, I don't think she would have survived that, uh, that week, that baby I sat with. And as a parent, as a mother myself, of course, it, it, it affects me. But my job is also to go out and try to tell the stories of the suffering, because despite everything I've seen, despite the fact I've been in politics for many years, I still think that the stories of those children can actually change how world leaders act. And what we're seeing in Yemen is it was when we realized that the suffering of children in Yemen is so bad that when, when world leaders realized that, that's when they pushed for some kind of negotiation or talks 
uh, taking place in Sweden. So I'm still hopeful that by shouting about what goes on in a war zone like that, we can change uh, how we are treating these children. But how angry does it make you feel? Of course, you, you were prime minister yourself. You understand the power of a leader of a country. What more would you like the, the most powerful leaders of the world to do so that these children are not dying? I think anger is the right word. It does make me angry. It does make me angry that uh, atrocities can happen. And if it's a little bit out of what we know or what we care about, it's like it didn't happen. I was um, a, a, year, a good year ago, I was in Bangladesh, where I went to Cox Bazaar, where you have Rohingya uh, people uh, coming into to Bangladesh uh, because of atrocities that been happening in, in Myanmar. And it shocks me that this can happen. This was what was, has been called by the UN itself, ethnic cleansing. Uh, and luckily, we were on the ground to try and report what was happening. But it does make me very angry that these th kind of things can happen. Uh, and the world do not always care. When I was in Yemen, I spoke to a lot of people there. And the one thing they kept saying to me was, we don't feel that anyone cares about us. We don't feel that people know what's going on uh, on here. So go out and tell the world what's going on in Yemen. That's what I'm trying to do. Do you feel that the US administration could be doing more? I think they finally stepped up. Uh, and I think world leaders finally stepped up and pushed um, the, the talks that we had in Stockholm. Uh, I'm always an optimist, so I hope something can come out of those talks. But right now, the situation in, in Yemen is as bad as, is, as it has been uh, for, for months, perhaps years even. Uh, we can't get access with our humanitarian help, uh, which is basic stuff like food and water and health services. Uh, we spend more time in checkpoints and actually getting access to the people who need it. Uh, we are seeing... Uh, a little bit of, of new uh, bombardments uh, starting in Yemen right now. So there is stuff that's happening yet in Yemen that shouldn't actually give us cause for optimism, but it's always better when the parties talk than if they don't talk. Hella, you became CEO of Save the Children in 2016, probably one of the most challenging times in the charity's history. Uh, your Save the Children, Oxfam, a lot of the charity sector were facing uh, sexual misconduct allegations and, and how did you navigate that and, and how have you been able to gain the public's trust back? It was former employees, but the general public was so shocked and horrified that what could be going on within the sectors? Yeah, one of the big discussions at this uh, World Economic Forum, as always, is, is the Edelman Trust Barometer, where we, they measure trust. And luckily, the NGO sector have not lo lost trust. We're still a very trusted sector. Nevertheless, we had our, our share um, of, of uh, things that shouldn't have happened in our movement. Uh, and in Save the Children, we had some sexual harassment issues that wasn't dealt with in the correct way uh, some years back. Um, and we have to deal with that. And we have to be extremely serious about that Save the Children is a values-driven organization. We want everyone to be able to go into work and feel safe. So one of the things we did in 2018 on the, on the, on, because of this was to understand that we need to be more transparent, we have to be more accountable, uh, but not least, we have to train the 17,000 member of staff that I'm responsible for. They have now been trained uh, in how to spot understand what sexual harassment is, how to spot it, how to report it. Uh, and I hope that we will see numbers going up in the coming uh, months and years, uh, because we need to find out there's a lot of dark figures there. And what I want is that these things to be reported, for us to deal with it, talk about it, um, transition people away from Save the Children if they shouldn't, if they don't belong uh, with, with us and don't abide by our values. So this is what we're going to do, and we need to be much more forceful than we have been until now. Hella, you've actually just announced that you are stepping down as CEO of Save the Children in the coming months. Was that a difficult decision? For it's an extremely difficult decision because I love Save the Children and I, I want... I want children's voices to be heard. I think we are so... It's so easy for the world to forget the suffering of children, uh, to not understand that when something bad happens in the world, when rules are changing, when people are, don't care about the wars and conflict, uh, when we don't care enough about climate change, the people who suffer most are the most vulnerable, the pe people without a voice, and that is children. So I, I want to speak up for children, and I've been extremely um, honored to be able to do so the last three years. But I need a more, I want a more free role. Uh, I'm stepping onto some, some board 
thoughts, uh, and I, but I'll still be engaged in, uh, in what I really believe in, uh, and that is to empower children and women uh, and fight for democracy. Of course, you were the first female Prime Minister of Denmark. Will there be a return to politics? Your name is in the mix to take over from Donald Tusk. <laughs> I don't want to return to politics. I uh, was 20 years in politics. I was member of the European Parliament. I was leader of my party for, for more than 10 years. Uh, I was Prime Minister. Um, I've been there and done that. Uh, so I want to have a more free role, uh, maybe have a little bit more free time as well, not sit, in a, sit on a plane quite as much. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to starting that new role. I'll still be coming to Davos uh, and, uh, and still be engaged in some of the issues that I care most about, which is empowerment of women, uh, rights for children, and of course, democracy. It feels though, Hella, that's a very fractured time in politics. We've seen a big rise in populism around the world. Where do you see this going? And, and should we be listening to the people more? Yeah, of course we should. Uh, I, I think we should, we should try and understand. And I think we're actually trying to do that in this World Economic Forum, where globalization is taking us. And I was so happy this morning to hear uh, Professor Swab say very, very clearly that he and us gathered here, we've never believed in, an, uh, in a globalization that was left alone. We always believed, and I always believed, in a globalization that was regulated, where we had a multilateral system of governance. And I think we are in a phase now, particularly where some of the the people who were part of keeping our globalization in a good place are withdrawing from that. Uh, I'm thinking here, of course, of the US who are not even here at this World Economic Forum. That's where other actors have to step in. Uh, I'm very happy that the business community is, is stepping in and want to uh, take their role in shaping globalization in a way so it benefits more people. I think the version of globalization that we've had until now is, uh, is now showing that it's not benefiting enough people and we have to create the right framework around our globalization so more people get agency so more people are benefiting from globalization and that they are shareholders in globalization. Hella, I, just finally, I have to ask you this because, of course, you're married to Stephen Kinnock, Labour MP. It, it looks like, at the moment, uh, with Brexit, that the UK will come out with a no deal. What do you think they will? Um, we could talk about this for a very long time. I, I actually am married to an MP who uh, is very engaged in, the, in the, um, these Brexit uh, talks and negotiations in the parliament. Um, but even I don't understand what's going on. Uh, Will the, it be a to, no deal? To the end game here, I am extremely worried about uh, no deal. Again, I think there's a lot of big talk about no deal. But again, we have to remember that the people who will suffer if there are no rules, if we don't take care of how we trade with each other, if we don't take care about what's happening in the labor market, the people who will suffer most are the people who had nothing to do with that decision uh, and who are the most vulnerable in our society. So I would warn very uh, strongly against the no deal situation. I've been in European politics enough to know that that would mean that would be real suffering for a lot of people. You have your skeptics in Denmark. Could we see a Dexit? No, uh, I think one of the most important to remember uh, about uh, the European discussion right now is that since 2016, I think it can be dated quite clearly back to June 2016, the support for the European Union has gone up in all the European country, member states, particularly in my own um, uh, country, which is Denmark, I think we are seeing an all-time high of support of the European Union. That doesn't mean that people think that the European Union is perfect or that everything is great, but I think it is interesting to see that we are. I don't think we've had higher figures the last 34 years uh, uh, in support of the European Union, and I think a lot of people are looking at what's happening with Brexit and thinking, no, that's not uh, how we want to go. Hella, I can't believe you're not returning to politics after that. <laughs> Hella Thorning-Schmidt, thank you so much for thank joining you for us. That's all for this episode. For more CNBC Conversations, subscribe to our YouTube channel, CNBC International TV. Thank you for watching.